Thanks, Pat. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is my first Dublin JS, so thank you for, for having me here. Um, I work at Intercom too. I'm on the developer experience team, and what we do on the developer experience team is we look after things like APIs and webhooks and integrations and all of the stuff that lives outside of the main kind of Intercom app. Uh, one sort of advantage or disadvantage, depending on your outlook, is that I get to work with a ton of different programming languages every day. I get to switch between Ruby, JavaScript, Java, Go, kind of Node stuff, PHP, and then sometimes even uh, I get to do some Haskell and things. So I get to think a lot about programming languages, and I get to see the differences between them. And I like to research where different ideas came from. And one thing that I'm particularly interested in is this idea of functional programming. So tonight I'm going to give you maybe a little bit of the history behind it, where some of these ideas came from, why it's so popular now, uh, and how it can affect your work today. So there's kind of a joke that everything that we do in this industry is just repeating stuff from the 1970s, but I want to go way further back to the 1920s and start with this guy called David Hilbert. And in 1928, he posed this question, this challenge to mathematicians called the Entscheidungsproblem. And this was kind of a challenge. Um, and it stated, can we have an algorithm that, given a statement in formal logic, would tell us whether that statement was true or false, and that it would work for all of these statements and it wouldn't give any wrong answers, right? So that sounds pretty reasonable. It's something that we should be able to do. What's kind of fascinating about this period of time, though, is that surprisingly, the notion of an algorithm was not that formal. It was something that mathematicians talked about and intuitively knew about, but it wasn't something that they could write down the definition for, really. It's a really old word. It, I think it's like ancient Persia, like 2,000 years ago it came from, but it wasn't formal until like the 1930s. The really sort of spooky and interesting thing about this is that it took uh, mostly three guys independently working with different backgrounds, different philosophies, and even different geographies to chance upon formal definitions of an algorithm. So from right, right, left to right, we have Kurt Gödel, who used the notion of what's called general recursive functions and Gödel numbering. In the middle, we obviously have Alan Turing, who gave us the Turing machine. And on the right, we have our protagonist for this evening, which is Alonzo Church, who gave us the Lambda Calculus. And these three guys, along with some contributors, effectively, effectively gave us a theoretical basis for representing and talking about computation. So I mentioned, mentioned Alonzo Church and the Lambda Calculus. This is the Lambda Calculus in its entirety. Um, you can do three things in the Lambda Calculus. You can have variables in the mathematical sense of the word. So you can define variables. You can take uh, things and you can wrap them in functions here. So this lambda represents a function which takes an argument or an identifier and has an expression tied to it. That's called abstraction. So when we talk about abstraction as functional programmers, this is what we're talking about. It's not a kind of fuzzy thing, this is what we're talking about. And then you have function application. So you can take a function and you can apply it to an argument and that's it. Like, so what though? Like, this doesn't sound like a useful platform for doing anything. I'm just talking about variables, functions, and applications, but I'm not talking about numbers, I'm not talking about data structures. All I'm talking about is these uh, three simple things. But in terms of expressing computa computation, you can prove that this is actually equivalent to Turing machines. So for example, this is how we count in the land of calculus. It's pretty crazy. I'll read this out in English. The first one is a function that takes an f and an x and returns an x. The next one's a function that takes an f and an x, returns an f and an x. The next one returns an f of an f of an x. You can see where I'm going. The next one returns f of an f of an f of an x, and so forth. And this is how you count. So it's with ingenuity and creativity that we can use these things, and we can do real things with them. But the power comes from the kind of minimalism. So can anyone guess, don't have any prizes, but can anyone guess what this function does? It's great, because I don't have any prizes. I'll tell you, so we can, I said these are our representations for zero and one. So if we set n as zero here and we sub it into this expression, we get this. I'll read this out in English. Function takes an f and an x and returns an x, applied to an f and an x, cancels out to x. So we've gone from zero to one. So what does function do? 
This is the how you increment numbers in the lambda calculus. This is the successor function. So now we're, we're doing live programming like it's 1935 or something. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Does anyone know what this programming language is? I'm not going to accept no for an answer. <laughs> yes, Lisp. Uh, specifically, what I'm talking about here is Scheme, which is a dialect of Lisp. And Scheme is very cool because it's very transparently the lambda calculus. You can see the lambda calculus in it as you write it. So there are a couple of things. Like I like to think that the rest of the history of functional programming is taking the lambda calculus and extending it, adding things to it. Um, sometimes those things are simple. So in this case, we've replaced our f of f of f of's, and we're using real machine integers, which is cool, which is nice, something hardware gives us. And it looks like we're also introducing let binding. So this is something that's kind of universal in programming languages, the ability to bind values to names and then use those names, and you can get readable code from this, right? It's kind of one of the bedrocks of readable, uh, maintainable code. But what's so cool about Scheme is that it doesn't implement these sort of features on the language level. It uses its very powerful macro system to build these things kind of on the developer level, if that makes any sense. So if we go from what this is to how this actually executes, Lisp will take this and rejumble it into this. So we'll switch back between these two a lot. We've got an A bound to one and a B bound to two. So we take the A and the B, the name parts for our bindings, and we put them in the uh, parameter list of this function, and we take the value parts, the one and the two, and we put them in the application part of this function. So remember when I said I emphasized that in the lambda calculus abstraction was putting something in a function? Well, I took the B and the A and I put it in a function, so I did some abstraction. And then I did one of the other things I said in the lambda calculus you could do is apply functions to arguments. So I'm applying it here to one and two. So this is more of a pure, raw, or lambda calculus form. And this is one of the reasons I like Scheme, is that it's so transparent, it doesn't try to hide it. So, um, skipping ahead 70 years or so, here we are. Functional programmers care about things that kind of naturally derive from this. So, the lambda calculus has no primitives for mutating state. You can't really do it. In contrast to Turing machines, Turing machines are all about mutating state. It's about moving a ticker along a tape and mutating state. Declarative programming. So functional programmers like to get away from expressing control flow. We're not interested in writing down imperative steps. We want to write down things and we don't care about what the hardware does to actually make that happen. We're trying to get to a more declarative way of writing things down because we think that's better. <laughs> uh, I wish I could put it more eloquently, but we think it's better because you can look at something and see that it's correct by observation. Whereas with control flow, I'm like this, um, this, which is harder in my opinion. There's more things you need to do. So declarative programming is good. Concurrency and parallelism. You know, this is a huge topic now because everyone says that more was wrong. We're not getting faster CPUs. We're getting shit tons of CPUs. And concurrency and parallelism is going to be important in the future. It's important now, but it's going to be really important in the future. We're not going to be able to use programming languages that make this hard, in my opinion, anymore. With the lambda calculus as our base, we get notions like referential transparency, the idea that functions can only depend on their arguments and can't depend on some notion of shared state. When we do this, parallelism especially becomes much easier, and concurrency, because we need to worry less about sort of the side effects that our functions can do to interfere with each other. It's a pure kind of way of thinking. And correctness is perhaps controversial, but functional programmers tend to care about correctness. Um, we, it's a kind of sum of parts things. When something's immutable, declarative, and you can use your concurrency and parallelism primitives uh, safely, t things tend to be uh, in a world where things are more correct. 
So when you apply these things to the web, one of the frameworks I really like is React, not just because of what it is, but because the authors write about their motivations and you can see where they get their ideas from and where they get their ideas from is functional programming and the Lambda Calculus. So to dive some of these concepts in, in React, we're trying to avoid direct DOM mutation, right? And we, we get these general immutable JS helpers. Uh, it's declarative, so generally in React, it helps you to avoid imperative manipulation. You get to express things in a more declarative way. And again, perhaps controversially, uh, this correctness and performance is a sort of sum of parts of these two things. So I want to zoom in on one thing, which is immutable data. Um, one thing that people say is that immutable data is great, but it's too slow. And that's because they've taken some uh, benchmark and they've run it and they've found that, in fact, it is faster to mutate data than allocate objects, which is correct. The fact is, though, that immutable data has the ability to make your apps faster. So let's say, as in not an unreali unrealistic scenario, you're building a web app using some sort of virtual DOM assisted by tools like React. And React will ask you in the next frame, hey, this is what your application looked like before this frame. This is what it looks like after this frame. Do I need to paint something to the DOM? With mutable data, that's a really hard question to answer because anything can be mutated by anything at any time. So you can implement something like dirty tracking to do it, or you can take copies and then compare data and see if anything has changed. With immutable data, once something is allocated, created, it has an object ID given by the runtime. If that's changed, then a whole new object is created and then the object IDs will be different. So all you need to do to detect change is to compare object IDs. So now what's faster? It's hard to say. In these sort of scenarios, immutable data is a godsend. But, but if we're allocating objects all the time, that means we're going to have loads of objects everywhere. And uh, again, we can look to theory a little bit here and say, well, if this red node needs to change, we don't need to allocate a whole new tree because most of this tree has not changed. Instead, what we do is we allocate one new node and then we cascade a change upwards. So in this example, this is uh, two, tree two trees safely superimposed on each other. But you can see we have kind of a gray tree here and then we've got a gray tree with this alternative spine with these green nodes. And that's just an example of one of the very practical ideas taken from functional programming and applied to the web. So in conclusion, um, hopefully I've said nothing that's too controversial, but maybe one of the more controversial things to say is that the idea of functional programming, it's fair to say that it wasn't so much invented, but it was something that was discovered and something that evolved naturally from that discovery. The ideas that we get from functional programming are cool because they're principled, and they have real benefits when we apply them. Languages like Haskell and Scala are scary, but the ideas are not scary. The ideas are interesting. And when you're a web developer like I am, you have a huge problem in front of you in so many ways, but one of those problems is this massive mutable DOM that you need to tame. And then ideas like structural sharing, persistent data structures, immutability, and persistent data structures is, are just great tools to have. So um, if anyone has any questions, I will field them now, or you can ask me on Twitter if they're, you want to call me out on something, you can do that too. <laughs> so is anyone any questions? Easy questions. Yes, hi. Sorry. Where I could keep state of my application in functional programming? Sorry? Where I could... Where do you keep state of your... State. So because actually, each application should have state, but uh, functional programming is just chain of functions. Yeah, so that's true to say that a functional programming is made up entirely of functions. But we can build abstractions even on top of those functions, and I don't want to say the M word, but the M word gives you something called the state monad, which um, is very hard to explain on the spot, but basically what you can do is build up these chains of computations where each computation is 
threading something along to the next computation. And that's state, right? So you can change something up here, and down here you have access to it. But it's changed, chained explicitly by you. And then we can build syntax on top of that. So in Haskell, we've got something called do notation, which abstracts again on top of that. And you get this, you get this sort of zen of stateless state. So it is possible. Stateless state. I think that's a paper. Let me check. I think that's a paper. Zen of stateless state. Because if not, I'm painting it. No, it's there it is. Brian Beckman, the Zen of stateless state. Um, yeah. So you can. The problem is coming from it from an imperative point of view and thinking that you need a register to modify so that some other code can share that. With the state monad, you get the ability to thread data through your application safely. Um, and I guess this video, if it's in my head, this is probably a good video to watch. Okay. Cool. Uh, so how, so you've always got a state and object to JavaScript because of the nature of the language. So you can't really do, like you can't fully from what I understand, I'm not fully prepared to be wrong about this, sure. but you can't do full functional programming, like the Lambda Calculus is still going to have elements of state somewhere in it from just inheriting the language. So is it purely for like immutable data structures, or how far could you take like functional programming in JavaScript? So uh, how far can you take functional programming in JavaScript is a really difficult question. Uh, you could take it pretty far. The problem is when you're doing functional programming, you, affect function, you expect functions to be pure in that they don't modify some shared state. In JavaScript, there's no protection from you calling a number that says, I'm just going to add one to this number. Oh, and I'm also going to send an email or something. There's no protection against that in the language. And that's what makes functional programming in JavaScript very hard. And that's what makes programming in, or functional programming in untyped languages is like very hard. Um, but if you're disciplined and you've got a great team uh, who like this stuff, then I bet you can take it pretty far, yeah. Um, I'm not gonna pitch uh, stuff that compiles to JavaScript, you all know, so I'm gonna do it. Any examples then? You may as well pitch it. Uh, is <laughs> pretty cool. Fay is pure scripts, pretty cool. I like the typed ones. Um, so I guess people like Clojure script as well as untyped. Um, I guess if I was to on the spot pick something, Elm, pure script, Fay, very cool projects. Any other questions? All right, thanks, Bob. Cool, thanks.